Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. I'm here to ask and answer one simple question. WTF is doom. What a strange thing to be saying. Sounds weird just coming out of my mouth there, but hey, we get to do it. It is by id, of course. The originator of a genre. A lot of people could argue. Was it the first FPS that was created by id Software? No. No, it was not. Wolfenstein was not the first first-person game. But it was certainly one of the genre definers, and Doom is the granddaddy of them all. So to see it come back after so long is odd, I think, to say the least. But it is a welcome return, no doubt, to form for id Software. Is that a bit of a spoiler? Yeah. I've already done a couple of videos on this game. I did multiplayer beta video, which was not particularly kind to it. I didn't like it all that much, and then I did 20 minutes of gushing over the single player, where my true first impressions of the game after three hours of play, and I absolutely loved it. Now I'm about two-thirds to three-quarters of the way through the campaign, and I've played about 10 to 15 or so hours of multiplayer. I've also spent a good few hours learning basics of Snap Map and how to implement a couple of little scripting events, which I'm going to show you as well. So I can talk about the whole package now, and that's the purpose of this video right here. So... Let's have a quick look at the options menu, talk about a little bit about the performance, and then we can just get back into ripping and tearing. Okay, so first things first, does this have pretty much everything you could ask for? It, it kind of does, actually. It's got a surprising number of options. This is the id Tech 6 engine, and there is a lot here, I have to say, including nightmare level performance metrics. Yep, these will show an insane amount of data about how well the game is running, how much it's using every single CPU core and all sorts of things like that. It's great that they included this. I'd like to see more games even included. There is a basic frame rate counter that you can have with the Steam overlay, but it's nice to see stuff built into the game itself, especially with the number of metrics that are available here. I'm not going to show them simply because I'm running capture software, which means it's going to affect the performance. I wouldn't want to give an incorrect impression of how well this game runs because it runs very very well there's nice little features like ui opacity for instance you can have film grain on or off personally i don't like film grain it also looks terrible in youtube videos has a tendency to make things look very blocky which is why i leave that off you can change the sharpening amount you change the rendering mode this is a little bit of an odd one cinematic actually changes it very slightly, but it adds black bars, and gritty, I could barely even tell the difference. It, it would be nice if they'd explained what these were before you selected them. I think that would be good. Motion blur quality, ignore that. I've got that all turned off. You've got depth of field and depth of field AA as well. HDR bloom, lens flares, reflections, page size, and all sorts of things like that. I've cranked it pretty much as high as it will go here. 100% re resolution scale. I am liking this resolution scale option, by the way. It gives you a lot of fine-tuning when it comes to being able to get a few extra frames out if you're willing to sacrifice a few pixels here and there. So that's always good. I don't see anything obvious missing with one exception, and that is the ability to shrink the view models of the weapons. That is something that I've talked about quite a bit in recent FPS, and it's... Something of a modern development. I mean, we've had problems with it for a while, but it seems like guns are getting larger and larger. And if you compare it to the original Doom, of course, well, that's something of an unfair comparison because modern FPS have been doing weapons angled to the right with a full view model versus Doom, which did only half a view model on the bottom of the screen, which... You know, if you think about the perspective, that makes absolutely no sense, but it was a nice way to conserve power and increase performance and also not cover the screen in nonsense. It would be nice. I think we need smaller gun models, okay? It's, it's getting a little bit silly now. Can we please stop? Wonderful. Outside of that, it's got everything you could possibly desire, including multiple forms of AA. It's so nice to actually see that. That's a silly number of forms of AA. I love the fact that they've got that. And a colorblind mode supporting the three major types of color deficiency, which is wonderful. Not a lot to argue about there. Otherwise, your separate audio sliders are available, subtitles on or off, mouse, keyboard, key bindings available. The only thing I think that you could say here is it would be nice if they had the separate bindings in separate columns. I know that's the nitpickiest thing in the world. It really, really is, but you can still define multiple inputs for a single action, which is great. So if you prefer keyboard or just at one point you happen to think, all right, well, actually I'm using my left hand right now. I prefer to use my right. Then you've got all of that stuff as well. There really isn't an awful lot missing here, frankly. It looks pretty much impeccable as far as I'm concerned. And you have the game options here as well. This allows you to turn on or off a lot of different HUD options as well as customize your crosshair style. 
it's not particularly brilliant. I mean, I'd like to see a couple of extra crosshairs here. I'd also like to see them show what those crosshairs actually look like in the menu so you didn't have to go into the game to figure that out. Auto switch on empty and new available here as well. If you want to turn off health bars, you can do that, that which is great. I don't think there is a way to turn off the amount of damage that you're doing in multiplayer. At least not from this menu. It may, there may be a separate menu for that. It would be nice to see them all sort of amalgamated together. It's kind of one little issue that I've got with it. It's that this game's actually kind of three separate applications. You can't go directly into multiplayer from the main game. When you load the main game, it loads the single player. And this is sort of Call of Duty style as well. You know, some of the Call of Duties did this. I don't believe they do it now. I think they don't have separate applications anymore, but they used to. And you'd have to load a separate multiplayer application. You kind of have to do the same thing here. It has a loading time. It loads into a, a new application with new menus and such, which is a little irritating. It's not the biggest deal in the world, but it is something worth pointing out nonetheless. I'm not even sure if they're separate applications, honestly, but you have to go through a loading process and you have entirely separate menus for Snap Map and for multiplayer versus the stuff you got here. Thankfully, it does carry over your graphics settings, so you don't have to redefine those when you switch between them for the first time, which is good. So yeah, I mean, there's really not a lot missing here, honestly. You know, minor nitpicks, not a big deal. Now you have three difficulty modes here. You can unlock Nightmare and Ultra Nightmare, which is a one kill and you're dead and you never come back sort of difficulty setting, which is crazy. They're unlockable a little bit later. There is a cheat, I suppose you could call it, available to unlock Nightmare from the very start, so you don't actually have to play the game through once to get it. But it is possible that if you do decide to cheat, you'll be put in what's called developer mode, which will disable your achievements. Now, on Steam, I could not give a flying toss about achievements, or ever, in fact. But what I have noticed is there's a bit of a bug going on at the moment, whereby some people get put into development developer mode despite the fact they have not used the cheat code. I actually have the same problem. And what that can also do is it resets your HUD settings and your difficulty setting every time you load the game, which is annoying. I'm not really sure why that is, but it is a thing. So that would be a priority, I think, to fix, because I do find it irritating. Now, of course, this is going to contain some very minor spoilers. I'm going to play a somewhat earlier level, but with a lot of my weapon upgrades. So you're going to see a wide variety of weapons. Those could be considered spoilers themselves. You know, if you wish to just minimize the video for the rest of it, you can. But ultimately, I can't really look at the game without spoiling something. This game doesn't really have a story to spoil, per se. But I think in a game like this, things like weapons and upgrades and areas are in themselves spoilers to some extent. All right, we're going to jump into the hell level, Candigir Sanctum. I, I think this is a nice one to show off because I've already shown you the sort of facility-like levels. I want to show you a very outdoor level with a lot of different themes and a very much a different aesthetic. And it'll hopefully qualm some of the issues that some people think they have after seeing some of the footage that... It's not Doom enough, you know? It doesn't have enough pentagrams, it doesn't have enough impaled corpses, it doesn't have enough blood leaking from the ceiling. I strongly disagree. Welcome to Hell, which has something of a piss look to it. I, I do have a slight problem with this aesthetic, I have to say, that I think that if they took off this yellowy filter, and I'm sure that someone will figure out a way to do it eventually, if they actually took off this yellowy filter, I think the game would look a hell of a lot better. I don't think it necessarily needs the sulfur look everywhere. You can understand why it's there, but I think vibrant colors, surprisingly enough, at least surprising if you haven't played Doom recently, are in fact a key feature of Doom. You know, Doom was not a dark game originally. It was not a game with muted color palette. It was very bright. It had very distinct and bold colors going on with it. And this game could have that. I mean, there are some levels that where it certainly does, no doubt about it, but I think it could maybe have a few more. All right, let's rip and tear. Here we go. This is the plasma gun here. And I, I want to talk really about just how confident this game is, you know, that, that I view this game as an expression of supreme confidence by the developer in what they're actually doing, which is a little bit surprising to see because I think it has had a bit of a weird few years where they've developed some games which maybe didn't express that, where they actually expressed through their development a bit of self-doubt in the kind of things that they were creating. Rage is a great example of that. You know, it didn't quite know what it wanted to be. It's got some Fallout aspects to it. It's got some little open world aspects, but it's also quite a restrictive game. And I think as a result, you know, people kind of lost faith in it. And I think it may have even lost faith in themselves, which is incredibly unfortunate. 
However, despite that, and of course the fact that Doom 3 was maybe not the kind of game that some Doom fans were looking for. It was a very different game. I don't think it was a bad game necessarily, but whether or not it was what the fans were looking for was a different matter entirely. I think at this point, it have basically said, screw it, we're going to do what we're good at. And that is create a high action, incredibly brutal first person shooter that has impeccable mechanics Excellent progression, great pacing, awesome level design, and gunplay that, frankly, is unmatched at the moment in terms of single-player first-person shooters. I really do genuinely believe that. I love Wolfenstein The New Order. I think that's a phenomenal game. I think this game might actually have a beat in terms of its gunplay. I think a lot of it comes down to the amount of mobility that you've got and how well the combat flows. It's incredibly well put together you know it doesn't feel janky it feels smooth it feels like every movement flows naturally and organically into the next switching between weapons is quick and encouraged look at this thing my god why does it have three three guns attached i don't know why it has three guns attached to it look at this thing oh god it's so much fun to use incredible and even the inclusion of these glory kills, which could have very well completely ruined the momentum of the combat, actually ended up doing the opposite. Uh, it's such a pleasant surprise, frankly, when it comes to that particular piece of functionality. Those canned kill animations are not the sort of thing that I think core gamers have enjoyed lately. They have become an annoying trend in many games up to this point, and people are kind of getting a little bit sick of it. However, they managed to incorporate them in a way that is so incredibly quick and so incredibly smooth and makes sense and keeps the pace of the combat going rather than slowing it down that I think the glory kill system is actually a phenomenal success and it really it had no right to be, so you've got to give it credit for doing that. Now, this game includes a few modern conceits, such as upgrade systems and things like that, and purists may very well turn around and say, well, I hate the fact that that is in a Doom game. Okay, I, I understand your point of view, but I'd like you to consider the benefits of such a system, and I do genuinely believe that the system does have some pretty exceptional benefits. I think that the way that this actually works and the way that the upgrade system operates truly allows for some phenomenal exploration and encouragement to go and look around the level and try and find the different little hidden items all over the place, little nooks and crannies and the secrets and all sorts of little things like that. Now, I think that including that has actually helped the game a great deal. Otherwise, you know, you might see a lot of people just running and gunning, running and gunning, and refusing to stop, and it's nice to be able to fully explore the level. It gives you lengthier levels. It gives you more to do, and it breaks up the pacing of the game somewhat. Where exactly is the yellow skull in this map? I do actually forget that. I opened that. I'm supposed to go through there. Something opened. I'm going to go grab the yellow skull from somewhere. I've kind of forgotten how to actually play this level. My navigation in any game, Doom especially, is absolutely awful. Well, thankfully, they have provided this very handy dandy little map. I have unlocked the feature to see the entire map and everything like that, which is helpful. And I've also played this level before. doesn't mean I actually remember where to go, but I have played this level before. Now head on down here. The inclusion of those systems encourages exploration, and actually, that's that is very Doom. There's no doubt about that. Doom initially had an awful lot of exploration, and it was designed specifically to ensure that you had to hunt down all of the little secrets in the nooks and crannies to make sure that you could actually maintain your ammo reserves and keep your health up and find hidden weapons and all sorts of things like that. And frankly, I feel that that is quite important in a Doom game. I think it's actually a core part of the Doom DNA, as it were. Ah, yes, it's in here. There we go. And I think to ignore that is to not really understand what Doom was about. You know, it was one of the first labyrinth FPS. There have been plenty of first-person shooters that don't really focus on navigation all that much. 
And that's also quite a modern thing as well. You know, the term corridor shooter has been around for a while, but a lot of modern games are a straight line. And Doom actually had incredibly complex level design that was really rivaled only by Duke Nukem 3D. And I think to this day has not actually been beaten. So that's a, a great reason to include these progression systems, but that's not the only reason to include the progression systems. We have ourselves a little bit of story exposition there, which is silly, quite frankly. It sounds like the lyrics from a power metal band, but frankly, isn't that what Doom was in the first place? Uh, that's pretty much the essence of Doom, you know? Doom is one giant metal or rock opera, a gory celebration of a awesome set of themes. It's not just the exploration, though. It keeps the diversity of the combat going. Uh, th that, to me, is one of the most important aspects of having these upgrade systems. Because you are able to consistently improve your arsenal over time, you don't really get bored of the combat, because there's always something new to do. You can always either modify or improve your weapon in some fashion, which is going to diversify the combat in and of itself. Uh, the fact that I ha now have the ultimate upgrade for the Super Shotgun, which allows me to fire two rounds, which sounds a little bit weird, but the double barrel Shotgun does fire two rounds at once, usually. It allows me to fire two bursts before I have to reload, which makes the weapon incredibly powerful. I also have that infinite micro-missile upgrade, as I showed you earlier for the assault rifle. All of these little upgrades have kept the combat fresh throughout the game. So it drip feeds you more weapons, but it also drip feeds you additions to your existing arsenal. Because hey, it realizes, you know what, maybe you do enjoy a particular weapon. So you want to invest a lot of time into that weapon. You want to make sure that you get it to the point where it's as good as it can possibly be. And you can focus on using that weapon if you like, or you can focus on using a lot of different weapons, and you will be forced to switch out weapons for particular situations, or simply because you don't have enough ammo. And thank god they didn't go for universal ammo in the single player. They did in the multiplayer for god knows what reason, but they did not in the single player. It's probably to do with the loadout system, I would imagine. But I think those modern conceits have added to the game. They're not unnecessary fluff. In fact, they're actually quite the opposite. Now, I do genuinely believe that they have added a huge amount to this game and they have pr improved it significantly. They have made this game just a hell of a lot better by their presence. And there is nothing wrong with the inclusion of such modern elements. You don't have to create the same game that you made 20 years ago, but you have to understand the DNA, the essence of that game. And, you know, it should understand the essence of their own game, but having played Rage and Doom 3, you might think, well, maybe they didn't. But I have to say, in, in this case, they absolutely have expressed that. And there is a lot to admire about the purity of this game. I think it is really easy to be a pretentious little twat when it comes to a game like Doom. And thankfully, not all that many people have. There's been the occasional ridiculous article, but who cares about that, right? You know, this game is selling phenomenally well and has received a great critical reception, and rightfully so, because it is a phenomenal first-person shooter. However, I think it's very easy to stick your nose up and scoff at uh, games which have this purity of vision. It's like, oh, well, it's just about shooting monsters. No, oh, that's... I'm just shooting all, all the demons in my life has no meaning and all that kind of nonsense. Y you can say that, but it's an absurd criticism. Because... You have to look at what the game has intended to create, you know, what the developers were trying to put together here and whether or not they actually succeeded in their particular vision. You know, you don't turn around and tell an artist, well, you know, that, that is an absolutely beautiful, beautiful picture of uh, Vars of Sunflowers there. But you know what would make it better? Uh, several cars and a few more people, and if you wouldn't mind doing an impressionist interpretation of the Sistine Chapel in that image while you're at it, then that would just make it a lot better. And you re really, I can't really call it art until you do that, you know? There's this arbitrary distinction of what is art and what is not that is usually expressed by people that simply do not understand what the whole thing even means. Adding a bunch of extra stuff to Doom would not make it better art. It wouldn't make it a better game. A focus on what the game is supposed to be and trimming the fat where necessary to include only the things which improve it, that's the sign of a phenomenal developer. That is the sign of a developer that knows what they're doing. That is the sign of confidence, supreme confidence 
from id. That's what they've managed to accomplish here with the Doom campaign. It's an expression of supreme confidence in their own abilities and them doing what they absolutely do best, unapologetically. And I love how unapologetic this game is. There are so many little things which indicate to me that the game has no intention of being doubtful about what it is or of trying to be anything else. It is so damn confident. And one of the great expressions of that is the Doom Marine himself. This is a character that expresses everything through violence, you know? There's that good old quote that everyone loves to bandy out. It's, oh, if only you could talk to the monsters. And, you know, there's been a lot of mockery with that quote lately. And, you know, it didn't necessarily... Oh, ouch. I upset the Mancubus, apparently. It, didn't, it doesn't necessarily mean exactly that, but the whole point was at the time that it was sort of almost mocking Doom for being a pure, unapologetic first-person shooter about shooting demons in the face. The interesting thing about that is that now we have a protagonist who, in stark contrast to many of the protagonists that we get today, doesn't speak and communicates entirely through how angry he is. You know, he communicates through his weapons and through his violence, and it suits, it fits the character perfectly. And that that is what's most important. You know, they could have put a character in that spoke. They could have had just tenuous and tedious exposition. They could have done all of those things. You know what? The thing is, they didn't do that. You know why they didn't do that? It's because it didn't make any... S why am I continually losing here? God, I'm turning to Polygon. It would have made the game worse. There was no benefit having this angry protagonist that just punches his way through everything when he's asked to carefully preserve this hellish technology instead smashes it, he kicks it. He destroys it because he's angry. You know, he hates the demons. He hates what's happened. He hates the company responsible for it. He hates everything. He is sick and tired of the nonsense. You know, he's a no BS kind of guy. Slicey, slicey. Thank you very much for that ammunition. And that fits the game perfectly. It fits the tone. It suits the mechanics of the game. Having a whiny protagonist, having a protagonist that talks too much, simply would not suit the game. It wouldn't make any damn sense. You know, there was no reason to do it, and I'm thankful that they didn't. And some people will mock that. It's like, oh, well, that's underdeveloped, and oh, wow, how childish. Oh, gaming needs to grow up. No, the people that don't understand gaming need to grow up. It's like mocking Die Hard for having too many guns in it. It is exactly what it's meant to be. Is it perfect? Well, no, not necessarily, you know. There are certainly a couple of levels which I found to be a little bit frustrating. Uh, there's a level which involves a ludicrous amount of platforming and a checkpoint that is way too far back, which meant that you had to repeatedly go back if you ended up falling down, which was entirely possible because you're trying to figure out the way up there. As sometimes I do find that the game has a little bit too much platforming, although the biggest objection I have is not necessarily the platforming, because it's, for the most part, quite enjoyable to jump jet around the place. But the main issue that I had with it is that there are a couple of sections where it takes control away from you entirely and forces a little bit of pointless exposition down your throat. And you know what? I find that to be obnoxious in a game that doesn't need it. It absolutely does not need that level of exposition at all. And the thing is, most of the game realizes that fact. It absolutely does. And yet, every now and again, it's like they just can't help themselves. That's a little bit of a shame there. But for the most part, they realize that that kind of thing is boring, that that kind of thing doesn't necessarily suit what they're trying to accomplish with this game. And that in itself is a great thing. I'm glad that they realized that. A couple of bugs here and there. As, as I said, the developer mode bug is somewhat irritating. There's also another bug involving the frame rate that happens every now and again that can be fixed by switching between the windowed mode and the full screen mode a couple of times. It actually locks it to 60 for no reason. This game is not locked to 60 frames per second, by the way. It's not like id Tech 5 had that restriction. This is id Tech 6. It doesn't have that restriction. And the game, of course, plays wonderfully with exceptional performance, as I mentioned in the previous video on the subject. You know, the performance of the game has been rock solid throughout. Barely any drops whatsoever. You know, extremely high frame rate, incredibly smooth gameplay, which is very important, by the way, and I'm sick of people not mentioning this, especially on PC. It's incredibly important to have that level of performance and the smoothness of the gameplay accentuates how good the combat is. And if the game was slower, if the game ran at lower FPS, if the game didn't have that level of smoothness, it wouldn't play as well as it did. 
Can we quit ignoring that fact? That would be lovely. Anyway, yeah, there's that little frame rate problem. I, I don't know why exactly that happens. It is happening to some people here and there. Not everybody, but it would certainly be nice to see a little bit of a fix and an acknowledgement of that because it's kind of annoying to have to switch between the two things over and over again to get them to work properly. But outside of that, the campaign is phenomenal. I've had an absolute blast with it, and 95% of it is awesome. There's the occasional little moment that goes a little bit wrong, you know, maybe just a little bit too much platforming or a bit too much exposition for no reason. You know, I almost try and express my character's anger through my own movements as I try desperately to get out this sodding room that they've locked the door in. It's like, shut up! I, I just wish the character would, would say something for once and tell him that. But, for the most part, this is one of the best FPS games we've had in a long time in terms of a single-player campaign. I would say that in many ways it does surpass Wolfenstein. There is one area in which I think that it maybe does not, which is the diversity of the levels, you know. I think that the uh, Wolfenstein being an awesome globe-trotting adventure really benefited it. You know, there's some incredible set pieces. And this game ha has its set pieces as well, but it's like hell and Mars. Facility, indoor, facility, outdoor. Uh, they do go out of their way to make things look a little bit different from time to time, but uh, I think it is safe to say... Oh god, insufficient fuel! Ah! I think it is safe to say that the game could use a little bit of spicing up in terms of its locales. Although, you know, I've still got five missions to go. There may very well be some really cool stuff as we go back into hell, no doubt, at some point during this game. And I'm looking forward to going back to hell because I've only done one hell mission so far. All right. I've talked enough about the single player, I think. You know, it is safe to say that the single player is absolutely phenomenal in almost every respect, and it's basically worth the cost of admission itself. However, there are two other components to the game, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about the multiplayer, but first we're going to have a little look at Snap Map. Alright, this is Snap Map. So, the whole point of Snap Map is to give you a level editor, which allows you to create levels which can be played solo or with up to four people. Now, this means that you can very easily create co-op maps for your friends, you can create death matches, you can create a few different modes that aren't actually available in the multiplayer. For instance, you can make Capture the Flag. In fact, there's a very basic template for Capture the Flag available immediately with the package itself. And you will also note that there are a bunch of different tutorials to teach you the various aspects of the game, specifically the map editor itself. Now, this is kind of a limited map editor. It does certainly have its strong points. It is very, very easy to snap together a very simple map. No problem at all. I mean, if I go to my snap maps right here, and let's say, for instance, that I have a look at some of the default maps. You can find it in the templates. Let's say I just want to make a basic capture the flag map. I can load into this template. And I can then add a bunch of rooms and alter things and design my own map. Nice and easy. You know, it takes a few minutes. Very, very easy to use. It would be nice if the object placement actually used the mouse. Oh, in this blueprint mode right here, you can very easily add different rooms. So let's say, okay, I want to add a 90 degree climb right there. Snap it in. Nice and easy. Hits. Why you can't just click? I don't know. Again, this, this was designed with consoles in mind and it shows. And that is a little bit unfortunate because I think it slows many, many things down. They could be a hell of a lot faster than they really are. We could put the gap right here. There we go. So I could just snap this down. And, you know, building a map here is incredibly easy and then you can actually spawn into it and you can go and check it out so if we just quickly click play this is going to spawn me in it's going to show you where the flag is and this is a very basic capture the flag mode which supports up to two versus two it's not too many players is it it's a little bit unfortunate it's limited in that way and i can go and explore it and I, then I can start to figure out, well, okay, you know, maybe I want to add something else. This is how the map flows. Okay, you know, there's the, the climb and things like that. You see the 90 degree climb as you go up there. A little bit of a set piece. And this mode is actually set up to automatically spawn different power-ups. So a lot of this stuff can be automated. You don't have to individually place everything. However, you can very easily do that as well by going into so-called object mode. And you do that by hitting tab and this shows you the level. All right, so here's an area of the level, and if I want to place something, I'll hit G. All right, let's say I want to spawn a chain gun, 
and I can put it there, I can rotate it, I can put it wherever I want to put it really, and then I can just dump it on the ground, and then, you know, let's give you chain gun, things like that. Easy. Uh, this is all very, very simple to do. However, when you want to do something a lot more complex, that's where it gets trickier, obviously, but it also shows the limitations of the system. So I'd like to show you something which maybe expresses some of the potential of the system, but also talk about some of the limitations as well. If I go to my snap maps and I go to my maps, you'll see basic currency tests. This is what I've been playing around with, and this is designed to allow you to collect currency. It creates a resource system within the game, and you can use that to buy a weapon. So if I go to tab here, it's going to show you a player start, and it's going to tell the game, all right, you've got to start spawning some minions for me. And you do that through the AI conducted survival. That's a very easy way to automate it. Of course, you can make this very precise, but this is an easy automated way of doing things. You want to just throw it together. And then you see this unholy abomination, which is like, what on earth is all of this? Well, this is a vending machine that I created to sell me a chain gun. And this is the system built to do it. You've got this, which is reference to cash. Yeah, so what I've done is I've created a resource which I've called cash, and this cash will allow me to activate this vending machine for a certain amount of cash, and what it's going to do is it's going to check whether or not I have the resources, you know, so this is uh, spend right here, that's the action, so on trigger used, this implements the spend action, and it says spend 100, and then it checks whether or not I have 100 resources, so if it succeeds... It will spawn the weapon, and it will play a sound. If it fails, Access it will say that. There you go. Denied. Now, what's going to happen is the enemies are all going to drop this currency, and they're going to do so in the form of a container. Now, this container spawns an object after an enemy is killed. So this is what's called the AI proxy. This means that you can as basically assign certain behaviors to everything that spawns. You can do player proxies, AI proxies. On killed, it will spawn a container. The container is a briefcase. It's a green briefcase. And the briefcase will have a certain amount of resource in it. So let me show you exactly how this system works. So if I go in and I hit play, then I'll, this is a very, very basic demonstration of this system. Ignore the big red cylinder. That actually doesn't show up when you play the map. This is just for testing purposes. All right, so up to the top right there, you'll see I've added an element to the hood called cash. Now, if I kill this demon right here, it's going to drop a briefcase, which gives me 20 cash. Now, if I keep killing demons, then I'll be able to get enough cash in order to buy the weapon from the vending machine. So if I go to the vending machine right now and I use it, it's not going to give me anything. But if I go and kill three more of these guys, there we go. Ow. I don't want to die on my own snap map. That would be very embarrassing. There we go. I've got 120 cash now, and now what does it do? What? Apparently, I am white, according to that, which is true. I I am. Why, why it told me that, I don't know. But there you go. And that's that gave me the chain gun. So I spent 100 cash, and I was able to acquire the chain gun for that. So you can see... There's a bunch of different possibilities with that, isn't there? You know, I could make a kind of Dota-like system. I can make a wave-based survival whereby you gradually upgrade your weapons. It's even possible to give your player levels and give him a bunch of different abilities and perks and things like that. That is all totally doable. Let's try this again. T-E-White. <laughs> all right, apparently I'm supposed to check my privilege according to this thing. All right, one way or the other. Yes, that's possible. The problem is there's so many limitations. Uh, for instance, you cannot use the majority of weapon mods that are available in the single player. I don't know why. There are only certain weapon mods available, which is bizarre to me. I, I don't know exactly why they restricted those different weapon mods. You know, there's you can get like the combat shotgun with a couple of different modifications on it, but you, you, you can't get all the mods for all of the weapons, which is just odd. You also can't create your own custom weapons, as far as I can tell, anyway. At least there's no easy way to do it. I'd like to be able to spawn a chain gun, which maybe fired lasers instead of something else, or maybe it was a different color. I can't figure out how to do that. It's entirely possible that a lot of this stuff is stuff that will be figured out over time, and there'll be clever workarounds. But the biggest, most obvious restriction is the number of demons that you can have active at any given time, which sorely restricts the kind of game modes that you can make. Uh, I initially thought, I'm going to make a, a little Dota-style game. Yeah, I'm going to have different waves spawn, and I'm going to give you resources for killing them, and you're going to get different weapons and upgrades. That's totally doable. It's just that the amount of demons you can have in the level active at any given time means that you can't actually have Dota-style waves without making a very, very small map. 
which is really infuriating. And of course, the reason for that is that they've limited it based on the memory of the console and all that sort of thing. That sucks. You know, it's very sad that what could be potentially a very interesting mode has been limited in such a way. Also, that player limitation is kind of ridiculous. You know, you can't make a proper free-for-all deathmatch with eight players or anything along those lines because the game is limited to four as a maximum and snap map, which is bizarre to me. So it's a nice little addition. I think it needs a lot more work, you know? The scripting is not that hard once you've figured out how these certain things like AI proxies work. You know, building this little chain wasn't that difficult. You know, if I want to chain things together, you can do it via a logic chain. You hit, you simply hit G and then you link one thing to another. So when you understand how that works, it's like play. All right, so I, play is linked to saying T. After that's been on sound finished is then linked to play B. And then on sound finish is linked to play white. Very simple once you get the idea of how the logic works. And it's cool to be able to build these modes, but I think that this needs quite a lot more work. It's not particularly well explained when you start creating really complex stuff. There's not a huge amount of information available in the game. It's not as accessible as I perhaps would have hoped, but after a couple of hours, I was able to get the basic hang of it, and I can create some stuff in it, but I think the way that it's limited is going to prevent snap map, snap map from being used to create anything particularly interesting. A lot of it is just survival stuff right now. If we go to snap map community, we'll look at featured maps. It's like E1 M2 tribute, and that's cool, but you can't even make E1 M2 properly because you can't spawn enough demons. I think like Mancubus Meltdown, which is fight a bunch of Mancubi. There's a music maker, which is kind of neat. So that's to activate different sounds and things like that. You can make a little memory game, but there's nothing yet which I view as being absolutely phenomenal. There's nothing yet which I think is an exceptional example of the different kinds of things that you could do outside of basic survival and co-op stuff, which... It's cool that it's there and it's going to give you a little bit extra playtime and it's certainly going to add to the value of the package. It's just a shame that SnapMap is not a more developed tool and doesn't have more flexibility. And it's also a shame that it is so limited by the fact that you also have to stick within the realms of what a console can handle. That is unfortunate. It is not a replacement for modding. Absolutely not. You, know, you might think that it is, it's not, but it is cool for tossing together little maps to play with your friends. And I think it's a nice addition. I just hope that they patch it and they grow it and they're able to really mature it into an excellent tool and they take some of the restrictions away for PC users. That would be kind of great. All right. So finally, another look at multiplayer. Now that we've got past the beta phase, we've seen everything that multiplayer has to offer. Is it any good? Well, I'm going to tell you. All right, folks, we're going to talk a little bit about multiplayer to round out the video here. Now, during the beta, I was relatively critical of it. I didn't think it was awful. I just thought that it didn't excel in any particular area. It was mediocre at best, and it also had some very questionable design decisions, which I think really kind of ruined it. Not to mention the fact that I think a lot of us were expecting a more Quake-like experience, and we ended up getting something that was more akin to Halo, which was not necessarily what we were looking for. That said, since the multiplayer is now fully developed and they showed off all the features and all of the weapons and have put all their cards on the table, is the multiplayer any good? Well, I think it's grown on me a bit. I've played a good 10 or so hours of the multiplayer. I've reached like the level 40s or whatever, which really doesn't matter all that much other than to say that I've unlocked all of the items, all of the weapons, which unlock relatively quickly, blissfully. You know, the fact that they even put those behind unlock walls is to me insane, but never mind. I've also unlocked a bunch of the aesthetics and the cosmetics, which are the main reason to keep playing, actually. And I think, surprisingly enough, the aesthetic progression and the cosmetic progression kind of kept me interested. And that weirds me out a little bit. I, I guess that consistently tweaking your Doom Marine to make the coolest looking Doom Marine and the coolest looking weapons you can is actually surprisingly entertaining. And really, I should have realized that because there are a few games that do cosmetics very well. Dota is one example. Warframe is another. There's a reason why Warframe is called Space Barbie. I call this Hell Barbie. This is really about developing your character in the coolest way possible and getting the best colors and getting the best armor pieces and things like that. I think it's actually a great example of how to do progression that keeps people playing and gives people little rewards for consistently leveling up without putting a lot of the game's content behind a progression wall, although they are admittedly guilty of doing that as well, which I think is silly. But I do enjoy the cosmetic progression. I think that's great. 
The hack modules as a form of progression, I'm not 100% convinced by. I wasn't convinced by them then. They have expanded the selection of hack modules significantly, and they have included some which I think are pretty cool in terms of giving you a benefit, but without giving you an advantage in the game. For instance, there's one called Manhunt, which finds you, and I suppose this is an advantage of the game when you think about it, but it's a cool little sort of sub-objective, I think, as well as giving you a bit of a wall hack. It also gives you a cool little objective to do in the game, which I think spices the multiplayer up. It shows the highest scoring player for about 20 seconds, and it gives you a bunch of experience if you kill him. There's also Bounty, which will increase the amount of XP you get. Wingman, which will increase the amount of XP you get if you participate in a kill. Osmosis, which gives you experience when other people around you do that. Those hack modules, I think, are pretty cool, actually. And I think there's actually, potentially, a great possibility to create a bunch of hack modules which mostly just do cosmetic or taunt-focused things, which do cool things or give you extra experience. And that would still keep people playing, it's just it wouldn't give you an obvious advantage in the game. The problem I have with the hack modules otherwise is that they're randomly distributed. They're randomly distributed at different tiers for some inexplicable reason. So if you've got a bunch of gold modules or tier 3, then you have an, an advantage over others. There's no doubt about that. You have an advantage over other people that don't have them, which I think is ludicrous and you shouldn't be given that. And also, there's just a huge power disparity between some of the modules. And some of them really don't seem to serve any practical purpose, whereas others give you an obvious edge, like the wall hack ones in particular, showing you where the enemy is. Giving you blood trail, for instance, where you damage an enemy and it shows you through a wall where that enemy's gone. That's a huge advantage. Not to mention things like counter intel and... There are also mods like, say, Evasion, where if you take a little bit of damage, you'll gain speed. That gives you an objective advantage. I don't necessarily think that those should be included. And I think that they do take away somewhat from the purity of the deathmatch experience. But I think you can argue that the Doom multiplayer doesn't really have a purity of deathmatch experience. It's included a lot of things that don't make a great deal of sense when creating what is basically an arena shooter style game. It's like, it pays lip service to arena shooters, but isn't one. I don't even know what you'd call it necessarily, it's certainly no Counter-Strike or anything along those lines, it's very focused on kills as opposed to objectives most of the time. It is quite fast-paced, but it's also based on pickups, which I think is a great advantage of the arena shooter genre because it reduces the downtime in each match. You're always doing something. In a game like Counter-Strike, there's quite a bit of waiting around, now, there's no doubt about that. Is that necessarily a bad thing? Well, no, a lot of people like that, but I like the fact that in something like Doom, if you're not fighting somebody, you are constantly looking for things to enhance your character to make your next fight easier. You're constantly looking for collectibles. It encourages you to learn the map. It encourages you to check the spawn points and things like that. And that taps into the essence of what made things like Quake 3 and, of course, even the original Doom multiplayer, which a lot of people like to discount as unimportant, but... The fact that this game was so popular that it had to be banned from schools and universities, that they had to block it on land because it was the game that was dominating everybody's time, should indicate how influential and important Doom's multiplayer actually was. Yeah, sure, Quake World may very well have established the online multiplayer arena shooter, but Doom and Doom 2 in particular very much established the deathmatch and the LAN play and all sorts of things like that. Anyway, that's sort of going off point a little bit. The fact of the matter is, I think that it would have been better had they just gone full on arena shooter. Instead of including these silly little hack modules, instead of including the loadout system, which I find infuriating for a few reasons. You know, it prevents you from adapting to a particular combat situation. You can get into a combat situation that you can't really win unless the opponent is absolutely polygon level incompetent when it comes to shooting. And that's unfortunate. Being stuck with those two weapons and potentially a third power weapon, which basically means you win the fight automatically unless you're an idiot because those power weapons are so damn strong. And those power weapons include the BFG, the Gauss Cannon, which is somewhat auto-aim, and the, the Chainsaw. Those weapons will pretty much instantly kill anything that's not a demon, so they're incredibly strong. But outside of that, you're stuck to two weapons as a loadout, and it's very difficult to create a loadout that would take on all situations. It's almost like they've made a game designed specifically around that. Now, if you talk a little bit about Quake Live and the addition of loadouts to that, you might say, oh, well, you know, Quake Live did this too. The Quake Live didn't quite do that because it let you pick up other weapons as well. 
Yeah, that's the important thing to bear in mind. You're not stuck with two weapons. You can get others. And that means that you can adapt to those different combat situations. And collecting those weapons is very important. And that is part of playing that game well. Taking that away means that there are some situations that you probably just can't win. And I think that that's actually artificially lowering the skill ceiling of the game. I don't think that's a good thing. What's weird about it is that I'm actually quite good at it, <laughs> surprisingly enough. I'd say I'm at least above average. You know, I'm getting great kill-to-death ratios in certain game types and doing very, very well. But I almost feel like I should be able to, if I practice more, get better at the game. But the game has kind of a glass ceiling. There's only so well you can do if you're engaging a guy with a vortex rifle when you have a chain gun and a super shotgun. There's not really much you can do there because you only have two different weapons that are clearly not going to work in that situation. And there's only so much working around the, that that you can do. You know, it's the same as if you had the heavy assault rifle, for instance, and you get in, you turn a corner and there's a guy with a super shot. You're not going to win that fight unless that guy can't aim because your weapon simply doesn't do as much damage as his does at that range. In something like Quake Live, well, you might also be carrying a weapon that you could switch to in that situation because you collected it. And that's not the case within a game like Doom's multiplayer. So I think that is inherently a problem. But it's still relatively enjoyable to play. I don't think it's awful. I think it's it's a nice addition. I just wish that it was better than it was. There are some weapon balance issues that I think make the game a little bit less enjoyable. The game is more varied, certainly, than the beta, where it was basically everybody running super shotgun as one of their weapons and either like vortex rifle or rocket launcher for the most part. But in this case, we do have people running different weapons. There are some underpowered weapons, as far as I can tell. The hell shot, I simply can't find a use for. It, it's an awful semi-automatic rifle that requires a lot of precision. It does 20 damage on hit. It has this sort of grenade-like incendiary attack, which does a small amount of damage over time. I think that it is an awful gun, and nobody uses it as a direct result. The assault rifle is outclassed by other weapons. The chain gun may very well be overpowered. It actually has a surprising amount of accuracy at range. And when you're getting close, you don't even have to aim with it. You just have, it spits bullets so fast that you can just hold the button down. And there are some weapons which are inherently much easier to use than others. Uh, for instance, the burst rifle is a fairly competent weapon, at least in its primary fire mode. I think it's single shot magnum mode, which does 17 damage and slows you down and restricts your field of view is not very useful, but it's tri shot burst mode, which can do up to 30 damage and more if you go for the head, is a good weapon. It's just it's tricky to use. So nobody really uses the burst rifle because the chain gun's much easier to use. The lightning gun is probably not doing enough damage based on how skillful you have to be to actually use it. So almost nobody uses that either. So half the weapons don't get used because they need to be tuned up, I think. And then, of course, there's the issue of the bloody demons. Uh, they, they're still not a good inclusion. I'm sorry, they're not. It comes down to the fact that one person is given... A grand old time where they're able to slaughter and get a bunch of free kills for the most part unless they're very very bad at it and everybody else is trying to take the demon down or protect the demon or waiting to pick up the demons rune when the demon is eventually killed and I think that compared to the power-ups like say quad damage and invisibility and regeneration and haste and so on and so forth it's a much worse design decision simply because those power-ups yes they make you more powerful absolutely no doubt about that but they don't make you super duper tough they don't give you power in all aspects, whereas the demon gives you power in all aspects. Quad damage, yeah, you do quad damage, obviously, but it doesn't make you tougher. Someone could still snipe you in the head from behind, and then your quad damage gets dropped. You know, yeah, invisibility is great and all, but it doesn't make you any tougher. It doesn't make your weapons any more powerful. Being the demon makes you more powerful in every aspect. Every single bloody one of them. They're surprisingly mobile. Even the freaking Baron of Hell is fairly mobile. And considering how tough he is, it doesn't really matter anyway. He can easily outpace a regular player and just rip them to pieces with one shot. Not to mention he has a ranged option too. It's nice that there are now different demons available. That spices things up a little bit. Nice to have the variety, but I just don't think demons should be included at all. And the one mode that I really enjoy probably comes down to the fact that it doesn't have demons in it, or at least it's very unlikely that you'll get to the part where a demon rune spawns, because it is a round-based game mode, and demon runes only spawn a couple of minutes into the game. And that mode, of course, is freeze tag. 
Classic mode, very popular mode in Quake Live. Excellent mode, I love it to death. The problem that I have with freeze tag is one, not enough people play it, so the queue times are long. Secondly, the rounds are very short, and the intermission time between the matches is incredibly long, like it's 90 seconds. You know, in order to skip that intermission, everyone has to ready up, and that never happens. So you can end up with a match that is almost as short, depending on how the rounds go, as the intermission itself, or indeed almost as long as the intermission itself. So you have a huge amount of downtime in that mode. I think it either needs more rounds or it just needs a much, much shorter intermission time. I think intermission time actually needs to be cut across the board because people don't ready up. It's as simple as that. And if one person doesn't ready up, you're sitting there for a minute and a half. And it's okay, maybe you can mess around with your hack modules, you can do a little bit of customization here and there, but that to me is not enough to justify those lengthy wait times, which is why I play the longer game modes like Domination, and like Warpath and things like that. And those modes are good enough, you know, it's basic domination, I think Warpath is actually surprisingly entertaining, I went back and played more of it, it's not too bad, I think it's quite fun to progressively move through the different levels, to fight in different areas, to set up ambushes and things like that, it's a great team-based mode, but I'd like to ask, where's Capture the Flag, Free For All and Duel? Oh, where are those things? They, they just aren't there, which is, it's insane to me that there's no Capture the Flag mode by default. You can play Capture the Flag with up to four people, but Capture the Flag with four people in Snap Map is by no means as good. And thankfully you can queue up for Snap Map maps, so you can play a little bit of that, but CTF with four people instead of 16? That's bizarre, and where is Duel? And I know that's a very Quake-like thing, but it would be lovely to see the inclusion of Duel. You could make it. I guess in Snap Map, but why exactly should we have to make that? <laughs> Shouldn't that be an inclusion otherwise? But with all of this criticism aside, the game in multiplayer is still relatively fun to play. The guns have a suitable amount of variety, they're relatively enjoyable to use for the most part, you know, some of them like the hell shot just feel useless, so they're not fun, but the chain gun and the super shotty and the rocket launcher are great to use. There's a good amount of movement involved, I think that Despite the fact that this is by no means a perfect multiplayer mode, it's still a reasonable addition to the package. I've still played quite a bit of it and I've not hated my time with it. I've actually enjoyed quite a lot of it. I think a lot of it does come to, down to my own personal bias because I'm relatively good at it and who doesn't enjoy winning? But I think that more important perhaps than the inclusion of this multiplayer mode here and how well it stands on its own is what it could potentially do to influence future multiplayer modes in other FPS. Is this potentially a revival of the pickup focused first person shooter? And by that I mean no regenerating health, you've got to pick up your health, you've got to pick up your armor, you've got to pick up your ammo, you've got to pick up your weapons, you've got to pick up your power-ups. Is this a potential kick in the ass for that? If it is, then I think we might be in for a good time. I'm not necessarily saying the revival of the arena shooter. What I'm saying is the revival of game modes where it's not solely based on your loadout. I'd like to obviously see the loadout system thrown out entirely, but games that are based on what you find around the map, scavenging for resources and ammunition and armor and different weapons, learning the maps and contesting those weapons and powerful pickups with different players. If Doom reignites that, then Doom's multiplayer has done its job. And it's not like it's horrible. It's relatively enjoyable. It's not great, but it has its moments. And that brings us finally to the end of this bloody video. Holy crap, that was long. Or for me, like an average length video, I suppose. The conclusion after all of this is that Doom is an excellent value package. It pays homage to shooters of old and of course, Doom itself. It thoroughly revitalizes the franchise and it gives us something that we actually don't have a great deal of these days and that is an adrenaline fueled action focused minimal narrative single player first person shooter an excellent campaign easily the best campaign since wolfenstein the new order no doubt about it may very well be the best fps campaign this year i'm not 100 percent sure what could compete with it at this point the multiplayer is decent, the map editor has potential, but is quirky and quite limited. The game runs incredibly well, which I'm hugely happy about, I have to say. You know, the new id Tech engine may very well not look as good as something like CryEngine 3 can, but the game still aesthetically sticks to what it should, and it invokes that great Doom feel while running incredibly smoothly, which enhances just how great the gunplay is and the pacing and the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay of this title. 
It's an excellent shot in the arm. Another shot in the arm for single-player first-person shooters. It's an extremely confident expression of id's prowess when it comes to this kind of gameplay, something we may have forgotten over the past few years with Doom 3 and of course with Rage. They are great at creating gunplay, excellent gunplay, tight mechanics, when they don't go off the rails with unnecessary nonsense. They make a pure, unbelievably enjoyable first-person shooter experience. That's basically what Doom is, you know? It doesn't need to be any more than it is. It doesn't need to be any fancier than it is. It doesn't need to be any smarter than it is. Because in reality, what Doom actually is, and what it expresses through its mechanics and its design, is incredible intelligence on the part of the developer. They made exactly what they were looking to do, and they made it to the best of their ability. Uh, you don't have to create cordon bleu. What you have to create is the best meal within those particular constraints that you set yourself. You know, if you make the best loaf of bread in the world, that's a hell of a lot better than making an average souffle, as far as I'm concerned. Now, this may very well be the best loaf of bread in the world at the moment. Maybe you think that you're smarter than Doom. I would encourage you <laughs> to rethink your stance. You are not smarter than Doom or the people that made it, and there is nothing wrong whatsoever with focusing a game almost purely on the action, especially when you do it this bloody well. A special shout-out also has to go to the phenomenal soundtrack, the reinterpretation of the Doom soundtrack from Mick Gordon, who is the guy behind the reinterpretation of the Killer Instinct soundtrack in the latest reboot of that, which was also incredible. We're talking about really down-tuned, grimy, heavy guitar riffs. I mean, I go as far as to say it's better than the original soundtrack. It's that damn phenomenal, and it just engulfs you in this wonderful desire to tear demons to shreds. Anything wrong with that? Hell no! I'm an adult, I can pick whatever bloody entertainment I want. And this is a phenomenal piece of entertainment when it comes to first-person shooters. It's more than the sum of its parts. Yes, the campaign is absolutely the highlight, and it's worth the asking price in and of itself, but the multiplayer isn't terrible, and the map editor certainly has some potential. As a value package, as a value proposition, the amount of stuff they've crammed in here is almost peerless. I think it is absolutely worth the asking price, without a shadow of a doubt, and I'm really happy to see Doom back, and I certainly hope that it spawns some imitators, and hopefully some good ones too. Doom, ladies and gentlemen, available for $60, your regional equivalent on Steam. It's also available on console. I can't imagine why you play it there. My name has been Total Biscuit. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then by all means, do feel free to click the like button. If you are just shooting demons and your life has no meaning, then click the thumbs down. And I'll see you next time.